there's probably uh, nothing more controversial, really, uh, than some of the issues we'll be discussing this evening. Uh, both of our speakers have served on the Senate Oversight Committee. Uh, it was my, I almost didn't say pleasure, but it was my distinction to serve uh, in the agency's staff, which dealt with the Oversight Committee some years before uh, both, uh, both of the two speakers. And as you all know, I think, who are following current affairs, the, the issues, tensions, if you will, between uh, the congressional side, specifically the Oversight Committee, and the intelligence community, and certainly CIA and NSA, uh, the temperature has risen, certainly, in the past year or two. And I think it promises to uh, rise even more in the months ahead. We'll be focusing on particularly the events set off by 9-11. What effects that had on the community, on the intelligence community, what that effects that had on resources as well as the individuals assigned to go there. And what were the effects on, on the community? We probably will take a look at some of the issues that occurred during that period, the renditions. Uh, certainly drones are a major part of what we'll be looking at. Uh, and the business of data collection, obviously triggered in great part by Mr. Snowden's release. So, that said, uh, let me introduce our first speaker, who will be John Mosman, who's the first speaker here. Um, he is currently serving in the intelligence community, though these will be his own opinions that he's voicing. Um, he will, uh, he has had a, 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 the distinction of having served in the agency itself, where he was chief of staff to then director of CIA, uh, George Tennant, and later is serving as the same, that is, chief of staff to John McLaughlin, who was the acting director. Uh, John is the former deputy staff director for the Aspen Brown Commission which was evaluating the roles and responsibilities of the intelligence community after the Cold War. He served as the minority staff director, so that's the party on the minority side, of the SSCI, that's the Senate Select Committee, and uh, in, on intelligence as well as on veteran affairs. Interestingly, he's the recipient of the agency SEAL medallion, which is given to people from outside the agency uh, for performances of distinction and assistance of the agency. He also received a DIM, which is the agency's highest award, the Distinguished in Intelligence Medal. So, John, without further ado, help me welcome John Mosman. Okay. John? Okay. Thank you. All right. Get that out of your way. Thanks. Thank you. Um, as Peter and the folks that helped organize this event know, um, since I still hold security clearances and I'm working as a contractor in the intelligence community, uh, my remarks had to be, uh, of course, reviewed for classification purposes. So I'll have to stick to them uh, pretty much as they are, but um, I hope uh, during the question and answer session we can perhaps open it up to a more um, vigorous discussion. Um, I'm also going to try to put um, the intelligence community kind of before and after 9-11 in an historical perspective. Um, I won't talk too much about current events. Uh, I know Andy's prepared to um, talk in more detail about you know, the drone program and data collection and those kinds of things that are so currently in the news today. Again, I kind of hope to join in during the question and answer session, but um, for a variety of reasons, I think I'll stick to more of an historical perspective and try to describe um, what I consider to be the major significant changes that happened after 9-11 to the intelligence community. Um, and I use that phrase, I just want to make sure I sort of define the terms. The intelligence community, as I'll say, is, was and is kind of a conglomeration of different departments and agencies uh, that make up what we call the intelligence community. CIA is one of those entities. NSA, the National Security Agency, is another. Um, and some of these are somewhat independent. 
uh, as organizations. Others are embedded in the Department of Defense and the Department of State. Um, as I say, it's an organization that no person in his or her right mind would have ever designed from scratch, but it is what we have. So I just wanted to sort of set the stage. Of, when I refer to the intelligence community, it's, it's beyond the CIA. Um, but I do appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight um, because I also want to speak about the people that I worked with in, in the intelligence community and at the agency. Uh, I think they're under enormous pressure today, and I'd like to uh, maybe address that as well. Um, but as Peter said, I'll, I'll make these remarks from my vantage point as both the Director of Congressional Affairs for CIA and also as George Tenet's Chief of Staff uh, before and after 9-11. Um, these are my own remarks, as, uh, as feckless as they may be, they're mine and mine alone. They don't represent either anybody in the intelligence community or the firm I happen to work with, which is Booz Allen Hamilton. Um, so maybe to, to start uh, putting boundaries around this complicated subject, let me, let me describe what I hope to discuss. The intelligence community was transformed after 9-11 by a tremendous increase in resources, money, and people that enabled us to relentlessly attack al-Qaeda and to support two wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Secondly, taking the fight to al-Qaeda, we were also authorized to engage in very aggressive, legally approved programs that, in my estimation, provided significant information and advantage to us. Thirdly, the IC was transformed by legislation that significantly changed the structure and the responsibilities and roles of the leaders of the intelligence community. But these changes uh, that have all taken place within the last decade also took place during a time when our political culture and environment was changing, and in my estimation, not always for the best. Hyper-partisanship, unthinking, accusatory public discourse is now so much a part of our modern culture that reasonableness and moderation are viewed as quaint and quite out of step. And further removed we are from those horrific days of 9-11 and after, the easier it is to accuse U.S. intelligence of going too far in collecting information. The dots, if you will, that we were accused of not collecting and not connecting before 9-11. So in my view, we have to find ways to inform our citizens of what I think is the essential need for aggressive intelligence activities because, frankly, the terrorists who want to kill us are still around and they still have the intention to do so. But let me talk about first the transformation of the intelligence community. Let me talk about what the community was like before 9-11. For over 50 years, the director of central intelligence led the community and the director of central intelligence had two other major responsibilities. One was to serve as the chief intelligence advisor for the president and the national security team in our government. That team consists of the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, the Attorney General, now the, direct, the Secretary of Homeland Security and others. But the DCI before 9-11 was responsible for being the chief intelligence advisor. And the successful DCIs who were able to do this were able to absorb and present the analysis that was being produced by the intelligence community on a variety of national security concerns that were of concern to the policymakers, wide range of issues, but, but you had to be a substantive leader in order to manage that part of the job effectively. And finally, the DCI was also responsible for leading and managing the CIA, a third responsibility. Um, before 9-11, George Tenet, uh, as DCI, was constantly confronted with declining or flat budgets at a time when we needed to refocus on and rebuild and recapitalize, if you will, the very expensive satellite systems, the overhead collection systems that NSA uses to collect signals intelligence and that another agency we now call NGA uses to collect images from outer space. Uh, expensive, complicated programs that were at the end of their life in a lot of ways. So one of the things George capitali or ca uh, focused on was recapitalizing those expensive systems at a time when our budgets were not increasing. He also had to focus on recruiting operations officers and analysts because frankly we had to recapitalize the structure and the, and the human resources of the CIA 
which had also either declined or been flat over a period of almost 10 years. So at, all, at, at, at this time, George, like all the other leaders in the intelligence community, was also focused on national security problems. The issues that faced our country uh, were serious. They included counterproliferation, counterterrorism. Uh, the issues that people hoped would go away after the Cold War did not go away. There was every, every bit as much need for policymakers to have information to make their decisions uh, as, as there was before and during the Cold War. But trying to get money from OMB and the Congress uh, was hard. Andy can probably speak about this better than I right now. Partly because I think we had difficulty in articulating the impact that budget cuts or budget flat lines would have on the intelligence function. Uh, I say that because we, it was difficult because we always kept answering the mail. In my experience, the intelligence community does not say no. It's not part of the culture. We try to respond to the requests of policymakers and those that need the intelligence to make good decisions. Um, so we weren't able to, to really articulate, in my estimation, the reasons why we needed more money so dramatically. And what we ended up doing, frankly, was robbing one program to pay for another with the National Reconnaissance Office, which builds and operates our expensive satellite systems and, and which in those days had more money than anybody else. We used to rob from those programs pretty consistently in order to pay for others. So after 9-11, after those horrific attacks on September 11, there was really a dramatic increase in funding and staff. This continued over a period of years to sustain intelligence activities, not only in the fight against Al Qaeda, but also to support war fighters and intelligence programs in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Um, Peter was no longer robbing uh, to pay Paul. Uh, this was transformative from the intelligence community standpoint. In addition, after 9-11, the president authorized significantly aggressive intelligence collection programs. They were approved by the Department of Justice, and they enabled the CIA and the intelligence community working in concert with military partners and foreign intelligence services to attack al-Qaeda to great effect, capturing or killing the very senior people, obviously except bin Laden, uh, who were responsible in large measure for the 9-11 attacks. There was also an emphasis at that time in better integrating the information we had about terrorism, and we created an organization at one point called the Terrorist Threat Integration Center. It was led initially by John Brennan, who now is the director of CIA. It was later transformed by legislation into what we now call the National Counterterrorism Center. But with these resources, additional resources and authorities, um, officers at the CIA and throughout the intelligence community were working at an extraordinarily intense pace in the aftermath of 9-11. I witness ener this energy on a daily basis. Uh, the CIA's counterterrorism center briefed the DCI and the deputy every evening at what became known as the so-called five o'clock meeting. Uh, representatives of the intelligence community, the FBI, the military, all participated in briefings which focused very specifically on operational planning as well as the most current intelligence about specific al-Qaeda targets and opportunities. Um, issues were raised, programs and plans were, were, were offered, and the DCI made decisions oftentimes on the spot. The briefings also prepared the DCI to pr participate the next morning with the President and his national security team in the Oval Office, where again the briefings were focused on Al-Qaeda, operational activity to attack, attack Al-Qaeda, and the incoming threat intelligence that we also had at the time. Um, what, I, what impressed me and what I was struck by the five o'clock meetings was the energy, the focus, the creativity, the depth of knowledge of the analysts and operators who were following various intelligence threads and working to counter the threats from terrorists. What also struck me was the agility that was possible within the intelligence enterprise, even as, as, as weirdly structured as it was and as complicated a structure as it was to, to manage and lead, it was incredibly agile when the crisis hit. Impressed me then and it continues to impress me to this day. During that period, we also knew that our work before 9-11 would be examined by congressional oversight committees as well as the 9-11 Commission. 
The deaths of nearly 3,000 innocent victims on 9-11 demanded that we determine how the attacks happened and what we could have done to prevent such unimaginable tragedy. As a result of the reviews, Congress enacted far-reaching legislation that fundamentally changed the structure and authorities within the intelligence community. The responsibilities of the DCI were reduced from three to one, that is leading the CIA, not managing the Intelligence Committee and not serving as the Chief Intelligence Advisor to the President and to the National Security Team. That responsibility, those other two responsibilities, were given to the new Director of National Intelligence. Frankly, um, I didn't support the changes at the time, thinking that the Director of National Intelligence would become just one more layer of bureaucracy with no clearly defined way to carry out the responsibilities that Congress envisioned. Uh, the other thing, well, for example, the, DC, the DNI was not given, in my estimation, full authority to control the money and the people in this intelligence conglomerate. The uh, Pentagon and its committees on the Hill were not going to cede that kind of power and authority to a DNI. Why? Because they also had those, ent those entities within the intelligence committee, some of them also were tied very closely and very directly to the military. I also thought at the time that lawmakers had not taken the time to fully consider the consequences of making such major structural changes to U.S. intelligence during a time of war. When I was on the Hill starting in the mid-1980s, I saw the Armed Services Committees consider long and hard the Goldwater-Nichols legislation that transformed the U.S. military into a more collaborative enterprise. That legislation took a long time to fashion uh, over a long period of time and a lot, a lot of thought went into it. But frankly, I also recognize that because of the 9-11 Commission report and also because of our judgments on Iraq WMD, there was absolutely no way to resist change. And changing the structure of the intelligence community with the creation of the DNI was not easy. CIA was reluctant to deal with those who established the new office of DNI. Frankly, it was tough being the central leader of an enterprise for over 50 years and suddenly losing that role on the premise that others could do it better. At the same time, there were elements in the new office of DNI that did not really appreciate the years of CIA dominance, some would call it arrogance, over the intelligence community, and they were eager to assert a different direction under their own control. Although I did not appreciate it at the time, the true beneficiaries of this change, this major legislative alteration, were ironically the CIA and its director. No longer did the director of CIA also have the added responsibilities to lead this widespread intelligence conglomeration to defend everybody's budgets and to make those difficult program trade-offs that you have to do when you manage those budgets. He also didn't have to take the lead in defending any and all intelligence community elements when things went wrong. The director of CIA was free to focus on leading the CIA and managing its sensitive operations, its technological developments, and analytic resources and outputs. From what I can tell after I retired from the agency in 2005, the CIA still remains prominent in terms of supporting the president and the national security team under both the Bush and the Obama administrations. Its, uh, its, its, its prominence has really not diminished at all from what I can see. Um, when I was asked to uh, prepare these remarks, I was asked to kind of try to put a face on, uh, on the intelligence community. Um, and in doing so, I've thought less about my own experiences and frankly, more about the people that um, I worked with uh, both at the CIA and in the intelligence community. Um, and I realized that with all the changes that took place in the community, both statutorily and in terms of resources and budgets, those kinds of things, uh, there was frankly something that didn't need to be transformed or changed. And that was the workforce that made up the organizations that we call the intelligence community. Frankly, uh, those people were as motivated and focused before 9-11 as they were after 9-11. Uh, but I also don't want to make them into superheroes. They weren't then, and they aren't now. I've never met a James Bond uh, or that one super clever, quirky analyst who figured out a terrorist plot in 23 minutes and saved the planet. Never met anybody like that. 
But I also worked with very serious, bright, and motivated professionals who were entrusted to gather, evaluate, and protect sensitive information, and who, like their partners in the law enforcement and military communities, recognized to a person their critical responsibility to protect our citizens. And it was this, this was a, a fabulous and great mission when I was part of it, and it still remains so today. Many intelligence officers are trained to, in fact, they're expected to take risks. This can take the form of recruiting sources in difficult overseas environments, human sources. It can consist of providing logistical support under urgent circumstances to ensure the success of a clandestine operation. And it can take the form of supporting military colleagues in war zones where intelligence officers have also lost their lives, tragically. Risks are also taken by engineers and scientists in divine, designing and deploying advanced, sort of one-of-a-kind technologies. And what some people may not recognize is that risks are also taken by analysts, people that collect and, or that, that rely on this information that's been collected. They have to make judgments about what the, what the information means. And in doing so, they take risks, because often the information is unclear, it's fragmentary, and it may be from sources whose reliability has to constantly be questioned. So even the analysts in the intelligence community, in my estimation, are asked to take risks. But in taking the risks, the intelligence professionals I worked with also understood that our activities had to be legally authorized. Uh, lawyers, inspectors general were embedded in the CIA and elsewhere in the intelligence community to oversee the activities and to make sure that we were operating within our authorities. They also were there to take action in case we found officers who were not operating within their authorities. And I dare say we discovered, rather than having other people discover it for us, when we discovered problems with how officers were operating under these, especially these new authorities we were provided, we were the ones that alerted the uh, Inspector General and the Department of Justice. Uh, why did we do that? Because we were authorized under very specific legal restrictions. And we thought if our officers went beyond those legal restrictions, then they were potentially in violation of U.S. law. But to put it more bluntly, uh, I worked with people that, that, uh, that, that understood the legal restrictions we were operating under. I did not work for a rogue CIA after 9-11. I worked with officers who sought to protect our values, including our legal regime, and more, more importantly, the value of protecting our citizens against more terror attacks. So I'll conclude these remarks by focusing not so much on, on budgets or structure or legislation, but about the people I worked with in the U.S. intelligence community. Uh, frankly, since I left, they continue to work tirelessly to degrade the abilities of terrorists to conduct another major attack like 9-11. They do not deserve to have scorn reaped upon them by politicians or headline writers. Frankly, they deserve our support, respect, and appreciation for doing the utmost to keep us safe. Thanks. Thank you, uh, John. You opened some interesting areas of questions and, and interest there. <clears throat> but let me go ahead and introduce Andy Johnson. Uh, he's had some 25 years of national security experience. Now, I mentioned that John had served as the minority staff director of the Senate Select Committee. Uh, Andy had served as the staff director of the committee itself. He played a leadership role in the passage of legislation reforming the intelligence community and modernizing the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. He participated in congressional investigations into 9-11 attacks and the pre-war intelligence on Iraq. He was also involved in briefings on the CIA's rendition program, detention and interrogation of terrorists, NSA's mining of communications data, and the deployment of lethal drones. So I think Andy's uh, remarks should open yet other areas of questioning. I will have a couple, and then we will turn to you. So, Andy, please help me welcome him. Andy Johnson. Okay. Uh, thank you, Peter, and John, thank you for a wonderful uh, presentation, as always. Uh, my thoughts tonight are those of a veteran of the Thirty Years' War. Of course, I'm not referring to the European conflict of 1618 and 1648 that redrew the political and religious map of Central Europe, but rather what I'm talking about 
is the never-ending pitch battle between Congress and the executive branch since the Senate and House Intelligence Committees were created in the mid-1970s over what constitutes congressional oversight of the intelligence activities of the United States. The relationship between the intelligence community and Congress is historically unique and frequently troubled, and at times to the point of being dysfunctional. Before I discuss the controversies surrounding the Central Intelligence Agency's lethal drone program and the National Security Agency's surveillance and data mining programs, it is instructive, I think, to spend a few minutes or moments analyzing this relationship. There is a legal and historical compact, a marriage, if you will, between the Congress and the executive branch outlining which intelligent programs are authorized and funded, which programs are not, and the restrictions placed on these activities. The marriage is based on a common set of beliefs, vows, if you will, about the essential role of intelligence in providing for the national security. The marriage is comparatively a new one, going back to the 70s, and is based on a dynamic tension between the two parties that at best produces a fragile equilibrium and at worst generates volatility fueled by suspicion, mistrust, and accusations. This marriage of ours bears many scars, and these painful reminders influence how the two parties interact. Though the relationship can be a rocky at times, divorce is not an option. There is a shared self-interest to make this marriage of ours work. And what about the children? Can the employees of the intelligence community function optimally if their parents are always squabbling about what they can or cannot do? In the aftermath of 9-11, America was unified to move aggressively using military might and intelligence resources against Al-Qaeda, its enablers, and affiliated terrorists. The NSA's warrantless surveillance program, and it was warrantless at its beginning, and data mining programs emerged from this dark day, as did the CIA's lethal drone program. A third counterterrorism operation of considerable controversy, the CIA's rendition, detention, and interrogation program carried out at undisclosed black sites overseas also was launched in the months following 9-11 to gather intelligence that might help detect, disrupt, and destroy terrorist plots. Nearly 13 years later, these three programs continue to be operational, though in differing evolutionary forms. And we continue to debate the tactical and strategic benefits and costs associated with each. Carl von Clausewitz, what, what speech doesn't invoke him, right? Uh, wrote in the often quoted uh, but rarely read opus on war, he wrote of the fog of war, referring to the uncertainty of information about or during war, the uncertainty of information during war. He also addressed the concept of friction to describe unforeseen circumstances which can impede or restrict activity and as a result, change the outcome on the battlefield. With apologies to the Prussian general, uh, let me offer a corollary to his fog and friction axioms that is relevant, uh, I believe, to tonight's discussion. Uh, that is the fog of secrecy. Aggressive intelligence activities are inherently controversial by nature. But the controversy surrounding these three intelligence programs was exacerbated, and the efficacy of, their pro of the programs was undermined, in my view, by the corrosive efforts, or excuse me, effects of draconian levels of secrecy and an almost imperious disdain by the executive branch as to the role of Congress and the role of the courts in authorizing and validating the NSA and CIA's programs. The fog of secrecy created unnecessary friction between the executive branch and Congress as our nation responded to the 9-11 attacks. The fog of secrecy undermined America's unity of purpose at a time when we were at war. The fog of secrecy made a mockery of constitutionally required oversight of U.S. spending and specifically of U.S. spending for intelligence activities. The fog of secrecy unnecessarily placed each program that we're discussing tonight on questionable legal footing. And when the existence of these three programs were made public and the lack of buy-in and oversight were revealed, 
this high wire act of expediency and exclusion by the then Bush White House began to falter as Congress, the courts, and the American people started asking difficult and important questions that should have been asked years before. As a result, the fog of secrecy hampered the operational continuity of our secretive counterterrorism efforts as ongoing programs were suddenly halted, put under review, in some cases for the first time, and reformed. Some background is in order before talking in detail about the data mining, drone, and interrogation programs. Since 9-11, the intelligence budget has grown dramatically, as John referred to, with the CIA and the NSA being major beneficiaries. According to the Director of National Intelligence, the 2013 National Intelligence budget was $52.7 billion. Another $19.2 billion was spent on military intelligence, according to public reporting, bringing the total to $71.9 billion in 2013. The Congressional Intelligence Committees are empowered to authorize the secretive intelligence community budget. Of the 535 voting members in, of Congress, only 7 percent serve on the Senate and House Intelligence Committees. Title V of the National Security Act, and of course, other than Clausewitz, who doesn't invoke the National Security Act in any comments, but Title V of the National Security Act sets forth the statutory framework of the marriage I was describing earlier including the requirement that oversight committees in Congress be kept fully and currently informed of all intelligence activities. But there is a carve out in the law for covert actions that allows the president to limit access of the covert action finding to the majority and minority leaders of the Senate and the House, that's four, and the majority and ranking leaders of both intelligence committees, the other four. The so-called gang of eight we've heard about if the president determines that it is essential to meet, quote, extraordinary circumstances affecting vital interests of the United States, end quote, the Gang of Eight com comprises less than 2% of the voting members of Congress. The obvious dilemma with this legal arrangement is what happens if one of the eight members briefed objects to the program or believes that other members of the intelligence committee not briefed into the program should be briefed so they can carry out their duties of oversight. Historically, this gang of eight limitation on covert action findings was limited to those programs with highly sensitive and risky operations in hostile and denied environments, typically with a limited duration. After 9-11, the executive branch took this narrow carve out in the law and drove a truck through it. Expansive expensive, legally complex intelligence programs, like the NSA data mining program and the CIA's detention and interrogation program, were briefed in a perfunctory fashion to the Gang of Eight, accompanied with the threat of sanctions that if the information was shared with other committee members, there would be consequences. The end result was that the congressional overseers were effectively excuse me, gagged and bound from acting for years while the other 98% of Congress unwittingly approved billions of dollars for intelligence activities that hadn't on, undergone thorough legal review, and I'll get to that in a second, or operational evaluation by the committees empowered to do so, the fog of secrecy. Consider the NSA's data mining and surveillance program. The Gang of Eight was first informed by the White House of the program in October and November 2001. Congressional approval was not being sought by the White House. The eight members were being informed, they were told. Secret Department of Justice opinions examining the legality of the NSA program were authored after the program was authorized and were not based on firsthand knowledge of the NSA's operations. In July 2003, the Senate Intelligence Committee Vice Chairman Jay Rockefeller, after being briefed on the NSA program for the first time, wrote a secret letter to Vice President Cheney raising legal and privacy concerns about the program. Handwritten, sealed, sent by classified mail to the Vice President who had conducted the briefing. And he never received a reply to his concerns. The NSA program ran for, ran for two and a half years before the executive branch sought and received a legal order from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court in July 2004 for the collection of metadata from telecommunications firms 
but only after the Department of Justice refused to approve the program's illegality. Another year and a half passed before the NSA program was publicly disclosed in the press in December 2005. Six more months would pass before the full membership of the Senate Intelligence Committee was read into the program and briefed in May 2006, over four years from the inception of the program on the legal justification and operational scope of the NSA program. What makes this whole saga about the NSA program more egregious is that the NSA data mining program, in all its permutations, was not authorized by the president under a covert action finding. There was no statutory basis for keeping the information from the congressional oversight committees in the first place. Fear of meaningful congressional oversight and judicial review, not fear of leaks, drove the White House calculus to circumvent the Congress and the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, in my opinion. The Bush White House handling of the CIA's detention, excuse me, rendition, detention, and interrogation program showed a similar disdain toward oversight. For nearly five years, the program was limited to the Gang of Eight. Press reports in 2005 and 2006 detailed an intricate network of black sites and harsh interrogation techniques, and only after President Bush acknowledged the program publicly in September 2006 were the full intelligence committees briefed into the program and allowed to review Inspector General reports on alleged detainee abuses, criminal investigations based upon conduct, and deficient legal analysis underpinning the program. Supreme Court rulings on the rights of detainees the detainee's adjudication through military and civilian courts, and the policy paralysis over what to do with Guantanamo Bay prison are ripe topics that require a much lengthier discussion. But I believe it is a fair assessment that missteps in the early stages of the detention and interrogation program are largely responsible for the legal and policy morass over the closure of Guantanamo we find ourselves in today. Similarly, oversight of the CIA's drone program has been hampered by the administration's slow response to congressional requests for more information and the growing demand for a public discourse on the rationale for the targeting of suspected terrorists overseas generally and American citizens specifically. I am mindful that John and I have been asked to speak on the question whether or not the drone and data mining programs are a net benefit to the security of our nation. Uh, taking some liberties, which I suppose is a guest speaker's prerogative, I've added a third D to the drone and data topic, that being detention. In my judgment, and it may be a little contrary to what you just heard me say, each of these three programs has helped protect Americans against the threat of terrorism with varying degrees of success. I strongly believe that the architects of these policies and those who carried them out were well-meaning, if at times, and in some cases I, I saw this, somewhat overzealous and short-sighted. On balance, however, the positives out have outweighed the negatives. And each program today is on a more solid legal footing and subjected to a more robust independent oversight than in the early years of their operation. Of the three, I consider the CIA drone program and not to be overlooked, the intelligence collection and analysis which produces the targeting information to have had the greatest impact in decimating the leadership of Al-Qaeda and its affiliated terrorists. The drone program has been a game changer, the effect of which is hard to exa exaggerate. On the question of whether drone strikes themselves and the collateral damage that has occurred, whether it's bred more terrorists, I'm not convinced. Violent jihadist extremism predates America's use of missile attacks and the deployment of more traditional military force. Al-Qaeda struck the United States on 9-11 and repeatedly before then for twisted ideological reasons and lesser grievances. The reality is that Afghanistan had become a terrorist safe haven under the Taliban and Pakistan had been battling a similar existential insurgency long before a warhead was married to a pilotless drone. Drone strikes, excuse me, drone strikes have stemmed these insurgencies and decapitated terrorist leadership, not fomented more radicalization, while at the same time reducing the risk to American lives. Like precision-guided munitions launched from aircraft and other transformational battlefield advantages, 
Judicious use of lethal drones should be seen for what it is, a military advancement which shifted the fight against Al-Qaeda and the Taliban in our favor. That being said, I support the idea being discussed of making public legal guidance on the use of lethal force against American citizens overseas known to be supporting or fighting with the enemy. I think that's a good idea. The American people should understand uh, under what circumstances lethal force should be used against Americans overseas under this program. But see, the NSA's data mining program, while not as decisively consequential as the drone program, has been a valuable tool in locating and tracking suspected terrorists, though it has been tainted by the reality that it operated outside judicial and legislative oversight for so many years, which I discussed earlier. Since much of the NSA's efforts have been leaked, but not publicly acknowledged by the intelligence community, I am limited to what I can and will say about the NSA's surveillance and data mining program. But I will offer two thoughts about the ongoing debate over privacy concerns and whether the NSA's examination of electronic metadata is a violation of rights of Americans under the Constitution. There is time-tested law in judicial precedents which allows for business records to be examined by the government for certain prescribed purposes. I'm not a lawyer, and I won't be foolhardy to pretend to be one, but the FBI has undertaken criminal and foreign intelligence investigations using court authorization and administrative tools for decades, and it has not in, excuse me, engendered controversies such as what we've seen uh, by the NSA's analytical efforts to, in effect, hook a terrorist lead in a vast sea of communication data. With the NSA now under the review of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, something that was codified and strengthened in 2008 with the passage of the, F the FISA, or Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, Amendments Act, the question of whether, is whether this court, the FISA court, can provide the same check and balance to investigative overreach as the civilians court, civilian courts also provide in criminal investigations, including a privacy advocate in the secretive FISA court proceedings, in my view, is a sensible reform to increase this level of confidence. Secondly, and perhaps somewhat off topic, is the observation that our daily internet searches and communications are being tracked and monitored by the commercial sector at an alarming rate. The specter of Big Brother, many have warned, is no longer hypothetical, or no longer hypothetical Orwellian concept. It's now reality, and its face is that of Google and Bing and retail companies that can monitor your cell phone when you walk through the front doors of their stores. All of which begs the question, are the privacy anxieties we're feeling being misdirected or exaggerated? Mm -hmm. My assessment of the third program, the CIA's detention and interrogation program, is the least favorable of these counterterrorism efforts. While I believe actionable intelligence was obtained in certain cases, the program's importance at disrupting terrorist networks and plots was oversold both to the Congress and to the American people. Harsh interrogation techniques were used on a limited number of terrorist detainees, which in my view, and the view of a more learned group of minds, constituted torture. More fundamentally, I am convinced that the available, by the available evidence, excuse me, that these so-called enhanced interrogation techniques were unnecessary in order to elicit actionable intelligence in a timely fashion. The FBI and military models of debriefing and interrogation had and have since been shown uh, this to be the case. More troublesome is the real concern that abusive interrogation can produce bad or even false intelligence. Exhibit A is the case of Al Libby's claims during abusive interrogation by an allied government that Iraq had trained Al Qaeda terrorists to produce chemical and biological weapons. This co wars claim appeared in President Bush's October 2002 speech and Secretary of State Powell's speech before the United Nations in March 2003 and was a pivotal argument in the rush to go to the war in Iraq the marriage of Saddam Hussein's chemical and biological weapons and Al-Qaeda's willingness to strike the United States. As we know today, that claim turned out to be false. Intelligence collection, analysis, and operations used to be called the point of the spear. In the hunt for terrorists, it is the spear. The centrality of intelligence activities to military operations generally and in fighting terrorism specifically bears no resemblance to the state of play 15 years ago. 
You can see it in how art imitates life. Take a moment to go look at the Spy Museum's James Bond exhibit. Compare the Daniel Craig James Bond with the Roger Moore or Sean Connery James Bond. There's a big difference, right? The nature of what we're doing in the field, as John has alluded to before, uh, and the, the challenges ahead of, for the intelligence community uh, have tr truly transformed not only our priorities as a nation, but have transformed the skills and the, uh, uh, the empowerment we provided to our workforce to go after these, uh, uh, these bad actors. So hopefully I've given you some worthwhile insights into this important debate, which I'm sure will be with us for many years to come. Uh, I thank you, uh, Peter, as well as the Spy uh, Museum for offering us the opportunity to speak on this subject. Thank you. My only regret is that we have to turn the room back over at midnight. <laughs> I think you, 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 between you, you offered so much food for thought. Uh, I would like to uh, use my, the opportunity of being the moderator just to level a couple of questions at you. Um, I'm often required to speak, and I'm often re required to speak to very young people, and I try to explain to them the nature of our government and the nature of the roles of the executive and of Congress. And, uh, and part of it is that, as a republic, it is, it, they, it is Congress who oversees the intelligence community, which has the authority to deal in secrets and in secret activities. My question Go, I, I have two questions. One, uh, the 9-11 Commission re recommended a number of specific uh, reforms or recommendations, one of which was for Congress to re-examine the nature of oversight. And as far as I know, Congress is one of the few actors to do nothing. Uh, and one of the things that occurred to me coming from my era was one model of congressional oversight was the atomic energy uh, committee, which, which was bipartisan. It consisted of people from both parties and could act in a nonpartisan way. Is something like that feasible? Is it even considered on the Hill as a possible form of reform? Um, Andy is really a lot more current, uh, frankly, on this than I am. But I think the answer, uh, the short answer is no. I think in terms of, of establishing a joint committee uh, to oversee intelligence operations in the Congress is really a non-starter um, for a lot of reasons. Substantively, um, both houses have their own equities, the House and the Senate. Uh, uh, it sounds trite, but I mean there, there are traditions and there are substantive reasons why you have two different houses uh, in our democracy and the prerogatives that each enjoy within their own establishments are something, something that they don't give up lightly uh, and they want to preserve. Um, secondly, nobody in my estimation has convinced me at least why having a joint committee would somehow be better than what we have now. Um, from my experience, and I served on the Senate committee uh, at a time uh, when the chairman of the committee was David Boren from Oklahoma. Uh, Bill yeah. Cohen also served as the vice chairman and the senator I work with from Alaska, uh, later was vice chairman. All of those people and the, the senior members of the committee that I worked with really preached and practiced nonpartisanship in terms of how they looked at, at overseeing intelligence. Um, people like Andy, I think, also had that same, at least my experience with Andy, had that very same attitude that politics and ideology, ideological uh, turmoil really doesn't have any place in overseeing intelligence. But what impressed me then and continues to impress me now is that the leadership of those committees, whether it be Senator Feinstein now or, or Congressman Rogers in the House, they really set the tone for the committees. Uh, if, and we've seen other committee chairmen, frankly, who are more partisan uh, and less concerned about, about, um, about establishing nonpartisanship. So I don't think the structure of forming a joint committee answers any question. I think, I think it's more the leadership of the committees, how they engage in that marriage that Andy was talking about with the, with the leaders of the intelligence community. Those relationships matter. Uh, when those relationships get strained, as Andy has indicated, things are, are tough. Uh, when those relationships are adult and they're nonpartisan, uh, 
uh, then you can work in partnership with Congress and the executive branch. I don't think structural reform is necessary. Okay, thank you. Andy, do you want to add to that? Uh, just a few thoughts. Uh, I agree with John's uh, assessment of the situation. The 9-11 Commission said that congressional oversight was dysfunctional, and that was in part a problem uh, in, in looking at how the attacks of 9-11 went about and not uh, being detected and disrupted. I, I thought at the time, and perhaps it's a bias, having worked in the Senate at the, at the, at the time, that it was a um, over-exaggerated uh, uh, claim, criticism. That having been said, though, there are always things that the Congress can do in a, in a better fashion, uh, and as well as the executive branch, in uh, optimizing operations and making our intelligence and military efforts uh, more efficient. Clearly, we, we, we adopted a few things that were not headline um, uh, war uh, worthy. We did away with term limits. It used to be that if you remember the Intelligence Committee uh, in the Senate, you, you could be there for eight years and then you were kicked off because they didn't want you to be co-opted by the, the <laughs> you know, the Svengali-like uh, uh, CIA folks that you know, dangled watches in front of you and said, fund us, fund us. Um, in truth, what was happening was it was preventing people from taking that those hours and hours of invested time learning about the intelligence community, understanding the programs, and then in providing informed judgment of them. Doing away with term limits was a no, was a simple fix to ensure that there was pl um, uh, uh, intellectual capital preservation in terms of our oversight process. We also strengthened our ability to work with the appropriators to ensure that the information we had was what they had and vice versa. Uh, more importantly, and, and I don't want to revisit my comments, but it only works if the party that is in possession of the secrets classifies the secrets, holds custody of the secrets, uh, shows to Congress what it has. And what I've tried to do is point out clearly and demonstrably that in the, with respect to these three programs, uh, that didn't occur. And our national, national security was not well served because of it. The relationship of oversight was not well served. And hopefully, uh, there's remediation in place that will in, uh, bring the parties together, as, as John says, in an adult mm -hmm. relationship. Because there's a commonality of purpose. There's a unity of purpose here. Unfortunately, hiding the ball or, or not allowing people to exercise constitutional prerogatives to, to authorize and, and fund programs uh, is anathema to, to that type of relationship. All right, I have a couple of other questions, but let's, let, let me just turn to you all. You've been listening for a long time patiently and see what you have on your minds. And if you'd be kind enough to wait for the mic, everybody can hear your question. Yes, right there. Thank you uh, to the panelists for, for speaking tonight. I just, I wanted to uh, pose this question to Mr. Johnson. As you mentioned that the data mining program was successful, I was wondering how you, um, how you would define success, though, because that seems to be contrary to what the White House uh, Review Group has concluded, as well as, or at least that it um, provided any sort of actual value to uh, counterterrorism operations. So I was just wondering how uh, you define success in that realm. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. And again, I'm, I'm somewhat restrained here uh, in talking about much which hasn't been officially acknowledged. Um, we were playing catch up with the NSA program in Congress when it was uh, briefed to the Gang of Eight, and I was actually brought in as uh, staff director to assist in those limited briefings and ask questions. And I remember once I became staff director and I was given that, uh, that duty, the first response was, why am I allowed to be in this and Senator X and Senator Y and House Member Z is not allowed, it doesn't make any sense. But I went through uh, some Inspector General reports, which examined the program, and I made a list of what I recall to be 150 questions, which I needed the answers to on behalf of uh, the Vice Chairman uh, at the time, Senator Rockefeller. At the time, uh, soon thereafter, uh, the program broke publicly, and it was like a hornet's nest in which members were raising their ire about why was I not informed on, on this program, how am I reading in the papers, et cetera, et cetera. All legitimate requests. But we did start to dig, we started digging, and we started understanding, and we started paying visits to um, locations. And my belief, and, and I can't give you a specific list of examples, uh, 
is because of classification purposes, is that there were instances in which um, the mass data was pulsed for contact information, phone numbers, and hits came up that showed communication with known terrorists, uh, or if you want to be cautious, suspected terrorists, uh, communications with folks in the United States and outside the United States. That jump-started what then became a parallel process by which the FBI, domestically, and the CIA foreign in foreign uh, lands, would try to provide their own trail of information to validate these, uh, these hits to further the information understanding. Now, what I think is a legitimate criticism of the NSA program, beyond what I've already highlighted in terms of it being too closely held, is like the detention and interrogation program, its successes were oversold. Its um, centrality, its essentialness to our counterterrorism operations was, was hyped. Uh, but, but this is a problem which is, runs across all intelligence activities, which is this. The intelligence community can largely, can largely not speak to its successes for fear of divulging its sources and methods. Its failures, though, become public knowledge, often. And the public perception sometimes is necessarily skewed towards the view that, oh, well, I heard about this civil liberties uh, intrusion where American names were pulsed on the system, in this case or that case. But it tends to be perhaps more like viewing an iceberg. Are you really seeing the full mass of the iceberg, or are you seeing just what's above the waterline? That's a tortured metaphor, I apologize, but, but, but I'm just telling you from based upon my information um, and my understanding as a healthy skeptic of the program, there was some benefit, but uh, it oftentimes was oversold and uh, twisted into something it wasn't. And maybe this type of discussion 10 years from now will give us a better insight into what the true value of, of that program was. Uh, but to say it was not with, without value, uh, to say it was without value, I think would not be fair. Can I make a sure, please. couple yes. of comments? John. Um, <clears throat> I don't necessarily disagree with, with uh, what Andy has said about congressional relationships or, or maintaining uh, too close a hold on information. Frankly, when I was on the other side of it in the Senate, um, I, I can certainly appreciate that. And frankly, I think one of the mistakes, one of the many mistakes that, that uh, I've made in my career uh, was not arguing strongly enough not to limit uh, these kinds of briefings to a gang of eight. Because frankly, again, I was on the receiving end of that when I was on the, on the Senate committee. And uh, you, there's a real constraint, that, that a, a lack of dialogue that sets in when you limit the numbers. And let me just tell you from a political standpoint, small p, um, when these programs uh, were leaked to the press illegally, um, it frankly would have been a lot better to have more members informed about those programs than just a few, because we surprised too many members of Congress. They were surprised, they were shocked. They reacted oftentimes without knowing the full, without full knowledge, and I don't, qual I don't fault them for that, but they reacted as, as people do when they're surprised, uh, and that hurt us. Frankly, so I am not a fan of, of limited briefings. On the value proposition, I'm more constrained actually than I think even Andy is in terms of talking about specifics. But let me let me try to put in perspective, especially an NSA program that collects a huge amount of. I'm talking even about the current one, collects a huge amount of data. Um, the question is always asked: Did any of that stop one terrorist attack? Uh, fair question to ask, but the answer is very complicated because rarely does any one intelligence system, whether it be from signals intelligence, imagery, from a human source, from open source, whether, rarely does one system give you that nirvana moment, that aha moment where he said, there's a terrorist that's gonna attack the subway in DC on Friday night at nine o'clock. Rarely does that happen. What more often happens is, is that analysts get some tip-off information from one system, maybe it's a metadata uh, connection with a known or suspected terrorist. Combine that with a human operator who may be living in the same territory. 
you try to find out if there are any reports from that individual. Combined maybe even with imagery saying, you know, the, the information we got suggests that that person lives at a particular location, but that location doesn't exist. So what do we make of that report? In other words, you're stitching together disparate pieces of information. In my view, I'm very aggressive. I want as much information in our systems as we can possibly acquire legally. All privacy concerns, you know, being honored. I want as much information as we can in our systems so that when an analyst starts digging into a tip-off, he or she has a lot of information to draw from. We're not constraining ourselves. So why, why people initially when the Snowden leaks happened, the, the question I remember on the Hill was, what did this ever stop? And somebody tried to put a list of about 58 or 50. I thought that's, that's not the right exercise to go through. It's what capabilities and information do we want to have in our position so that when the question comes, we're in a better position to answer it. Okay, right here, uh, Laura, yeah. Where? Right here. Yeah. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, last week we were uh, blessed to have two gentlemen uh, speak to us, one of whom was Phil Mudd. Mm -hmm. And he gave a pretty compelling uh, uh, dissertation, almost, uh, citing one poor woman who was sitting over here <laughs> as the woman who uh, was being tracked. Uh, and all of the different uh, methods of information uh, getting which may or may not uh, tell agencies that there may be something happening, and it may be tonight, which is crucial. And I think it's selling the American public short. Uh, there may be too many who should be sold short. But I think it's selling the American public short to have actually have to think that we don't appreciate the fact that, of course, there are many, many, many times things are, things don't happen because of all the good work that the people in the security departments do and that we shouldn't know about them. Um, that said, I just wanted to get that in. But that said, I want to pull it back to drones, um, which is kind of why we're, we're all here. We have five wonderful gentlemen now uh, released from Gitmo. And my husband thought it might have been a great plan to implant some chips before we released them. Um, you mean we haven't? No. <laughs> <laughs> but, but seriously, we, we have a lot of capabilities. They're, they may or may not live over there in the lap of luxury for a year before going back to Afghanistan. What can we do legally, drone-wise, to track them and try and not make the 9,000 or so soldiers who remain over there past December uh, bigger sitting ducks? Thank you. Um, thank you for your comments. and. With no fear of, of hyperbole, exaggeration, or anything, I think our ability to track an individual in a foreign country in a denied area, or in a not in a denied area, using a variety of means, as John has alluded to before, uh, imagery, drones, human intelligence, other technical means, is, is, is beyond um, 
the ability of any other nation or organization in the world. We have the preeminent ability to do that. Now, having said that, um, and, and I truly believe, but I do not have firsthand knowledge of this, that this is a major priority in the intelligence community to track high value targets or known terrorists, their activities, who they speak with, who they meet with, where they travel, and their, their, their routine of, of daily life. John Kerry famously spoke recently about, you know, we will follow them and if they join the fight, I'm paraphrasing, you know, they have the risk of being killed as well. Um, red meat, but the sort of thing that I think people, many people need to hear, which is if they join the fight, they're like no, like everyone else, they, they are a target. Uh, if they join an organization whose avowed cause is to strike and kill Americans and our allies and others. Um, so that being said, I, I really think that one, and this maybe is a subject for a future discussion here at the Spy Museum, one thing that's forgotten or not seen uh, um, and not discussed enough is the marriage, I keep on using that word, I apologize, mm -hmm. um, of intelligence to projection of military power. There's been a crucible of sorts in Iraq and in Afghanistan that has so blended together seamlessly, not, not to perfection, but seamlessly, the collection of intelligence and the timeline it takes to then queue resources, helicopters, ground troops, drone missiles, whatever, to the target that is stunningly efficient. And they say necessity is a mother of invention. In large part, that's what's happened uh, in the last 10 years. We have become incredibly efficient at taking that those disparate uh, that disparate uh, quilt, if you will, of information, putting together, making with alacrity a judgment call on whether that is a target we want to move against, and then move against that target. It's not done slapdashly. It's done with with great precision and care. But we have now we have now gotten to a point where those timelines have gone from hours two minutes in a way that uh, has really uh, kept the, the bad guys on the defensive in terms of the amount of time they spend outdoors, the amount of time they spend on the phone, the amount of time they spend in cars going from point A to point B. You know, speaking as an operations officer, I rather like the chip in the head trick that you, yeah. that you came up with there. John does it with his dogs. <laughs> <all the time. laughs> what, uh, but let me ask you, and this is based on the comments that you just made. One of the concern, criticisms slash concerns that we hear is has the community, specifically CIA, become too militarized, too caught up in the support of the warfighter that we've lost some of our traditional uh, coverage of areas and so forth with human, human intelligence, case officers, uh, not boots on the ground, but uh, people undercover on the ground. I mean, again, being careful uh, about not talking about classified capabilities. Um, you know, we've, we've heard that. We've heard about the militarization of CIA. But frankly, it's not a new issue. It, it goes back to other conflicts that we've had. Um, I, I frankly think that, as Andy has indicated, the, the stunning uh, marriage of national intelligence capabilities with the military um, has really, again, transformed the way we deal with threats uh, around the world which, by the way, footnote is why it is so absolutely egregious when our methods and sources are leaked. I mean, I just make that point. Uh, I don't even want to mention Edward Snowden's name, but I will. Uh, it's not so much the substance of, of, of what, he, what, he, what, what we know about, because that's kind of ephemeral, but it's the methods and the sources and the technologies that have been developed over, over a period of years at great cost with great effect that, that allows people like Andy was talking about who are maybe shy about going outside, they may be less concerned about that if they sort of know how to avoid the U.S. intelligence capabilities. So leaks matter. But I think back to the, uh, back to the question about militarization of CIA, I'm not so much concerned about what the agency does now because it's developed a, a really terrific expertise. What I frankly think we have to worry about a little bit in, in the agency and, and in the rest of the community is uh, the focus of our attention has clearly been wars and, and terrorism. 
uh, for great reasons, uh, for good reasons. We also have other conflicts in the world and other complexities in the world, particularly in the Mideast after the Arab Spring. We have, we have parts of the world that frankly I worry that we're not covering enough. And so rather than, uh, and we're going to also have a number of operations officers and other people that were with the CIA overseas in war zones coming back, I think they have to be retrained and redeployed so that we have greater coverage of those kinds of conflicts that frankly may bite us uh, in the future. So I don't really see an over-militarization of CIA. I see um, a change of direction perhaps in terms of scope. Uh, General Petraeus mentioned this in his confirmation hearing to BDCI, and his, his goal at the time was to, was to think more globally and to deploy more globally so that we actually have more people in place to, to gather these important secrets. Okay. Over here? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm worried about the checks and balances, the morality of our country, and what path you gentlemen have been talking about tonight. Um, quick statement, a quick uh, question for both of you. Drones are being used by the United States to murder human beings. By using drones in this manner, they have been abused and misused. Therefore, the trust has been broken for future use that's being planned in this country, too. We are seeing an escalation in violent responses to their use. Violence begets more violence. Thousands have already been killed by these drones. This has led to thousands more people to hate the United States and take action against U.S. interests and its allies. And we know about Monday's attack in Pakistan that killed around 30 people and attacked many of the aircraft there. And the people responsible said this was in response to the drone attacks on our civilian populations. My question, where is the oversight, responsibility, and consequences for the analysts and others that take these risks and kill innocent civilians? Uh, I addressed this in part uh, and maybe gave it short shrift um, in my comments because of the amount of time that was given. Um, why wouldn't the Pakistani Taliban say it's because of drone attacks when they know drone attacks have been an effective tool against their cause? Um, I, I made the point earlier, and I, and I think the timeline supports this, which is the radicalization of um, and the jihadist movements in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and elsewhere uh, predate um, the use of drone attacks. That's not the cause for why they are attempting to kill innocents at airports or at schools or at markets. Uh, it's a way of deflecting their, their murderous acts against innocent civilians against uh, the United States. Now, you made a point, and you obviously feel very strongly about it, so I'm not, I'm not discounting it that the United States is practicing similar actions. Uh, right. Um, and I'm not trying to be glib about this, and please don't take it that way, but if, if these individuals were um, uh, killed, uh, both the suspected combatants and terrorists, as well as innocents who were in the proximity of the target, so-called collateral damage, uh, by precision-guided munition fired from a B-1 or an F-117 or whatever the case may be, would that make the difference? It seems to me that um, the answer to that is no. But uh, it's, it is a complex issue, which is, are we projecting force through a means that, and it's, in, it's, it's printed on the, the, uh, the topic discussion for this meeting, that is, in effect, radicalizing people against the United States that otherwise would not be radicalized. I personally don't buy into the presumption that they have a reason to be radicalized and the drone attacks is that reason. I believe the radicalization and the, 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 the fight that was brought against the United States was of their choosing and we are using the necessary means um, and pursuant to, and I hate this phrase, the rules of war because in many cases there are not rules of war. Um, we're bringing the fight to them that they had started. So in many ways, I understand your point, and I'm not dismissing it. I just come out of it differently, which is drone attacks are not the reason why we're fighting a persistent and well-organized uh, terrorist jihadist uh, movement that is continually probing our defenses to kill Americans here and elsewhere. Um, it, it is an effective tool that they're trying to uh, make more controversial 
in a way to pull away one of the arrows of the quiver uh, that we, we, we presently use. Drone attacks publicly reported by organizations that have studied this have killed, I believe, 440, and I apologize, I'm not trying to be authoritative about it, uh, known or suspected terrorists uh, through these drone strikes. And there's been a big spike and then a drop off. You are absolutely correct. Individuals uh, have been killed uh, that have uh, had no connection to that cause. Um, and um, every war and every armed conflict has unfortunately borne that stain. Right here, uh, Amanda, I think. Oh, Laura's got it. Here we go. Thank you, Vince. Um, again, on the, the drone strikes, and I come from a different perspective, accepting the necessity for our use of these strikes while recognizing that in some, it's un, a, the deaths of, of proximate civilians are an unfortunate necessity. But our president has taken it upon himself to personally approve the, the individuals killed as a result of drone strikes. My question is, is that really necessary, or would it be better for the United States if our current or future president were not personally approving the targets of drone strikes? Um, I really can't comment on, on the fact that that's happening, um, but uh, I think the, the um, president's message, and I know when John Brennan was in his confirmation hearing, his same message is uh, drone strikes are not, under, uh, not undertaken without great thought and without great care. Uh, there is risk, as Andy has mentioned and as, and as the gentleman earlier mentioned. Um, but I am confident because I, I, I know John and I know other people involved uh, with the community still uh, that these are not undertaken lightly. Uh, the analysis that goes into whether or not a drone should even be used uh, is done with great care. Um, I know there have been legal analyses about the legality of using drones. I, I see in the press that uh, maybe soon the legal opinions that underlie this activity, uh, that underpin this activity rather, uh, are going to be released um, sometime. So I, I think maybe when you see that, you'll understand the sort of um, thoughtfulness and care that goes into this. Um, but as I made, made uh, note in my, in my comments, um, I don't see anybody going rogue in the intelligence community. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the things we don't do very well at all is to describe to the American public the kind of oversight mechanisms that exist not just in NSA or CIA, but all throughout uh, the intelligence establishment. And I'm not talking here about Congress. I'm talking about what internal mechanisms exist uh, after action reviews, if you will, to determine did we get it right? If we didn't get it right, what mistakes did we make that we're not going to repeat in the future? Um, that is ongoing. Uh, it's ongoing with NSA in terms of complying with the kinds of legal restrictions that people are under at the, at the fort in terms of collecting information. And it's true, in my experience, throughout the intelligence community. So, whereas I appreciate Andy's, Andy's thoughts that the relationships with the oversight committees in Congress get frayed. That doesn't mean that oversight doesn't exist, even, even in its darkest days on the Hill, because there is a regime of oversight that takes place within the intelligence communities that I think would surprise people, and that's the problem. We, we ought to be a lot more forthcoming in describing that. Uh, not to belabor the point, but I was thinking the other day when I was reading a I think it was Vodafone, was it? One of, one of the major um, telecommunications companies in Great Britain just issued a report about how what it plans to do in terms of notifying its customers in a variety of different countries, in Europe particularly, about what it does responding to government requests for its information. And it's going to do that on a statistical basis. It's going to do that on a timeline basis so that the customers of that telecommunications company will know that it is providing certain information to law enforcement or to, or, or to other governments in, uh, in Europe. Um, it's a very interesting report to read. I frankly think we need to do that more in the intelligence community. We need to show people that we, that we do care, 
about compliance with the law and with making the right judgments. Because as I said, it's a risk-taking business. And, and for the most part, we get it right, and sometimes we don't. But if we don't get it right, then we do our own evaluations of why to make sure that we, that we correct any problems that we have. Peter, okay. we have one over here. You have a question? <clears throat> yes, right here. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, Delman, I was just uh, wondering if, kind of thinking historically, again, if you can discuss the role of John Wu in, uh, yeah. you know, drafting some of the, you know, the memorandums that led to the secrecy of those post-9-11 uh, programs you discussed. My, um, Andy's favorite topic. <laughs> yeah. <I don't> know. <laughs> My heart goes out to uh, the individuals at uh, the CIA that were often that were tasked to do a legal review internally uh, at the Office of Legal Counsel about the CIA's detention program, about the NSA's um, uh, data mining program. That's the parlance we're using here today. But I have to say, and and I, I'm not going to get into too much detail. I'm just going to give you the bottom line. Um, I read those reviews, or excuse me, those um, legal analyses. I'm not a lawyer, so uh, I come at it with a little bit of uh, naivete and perhaps lack of legal training. Um, but I was stunned by the, and I'll use the word superficiality associated with the NSA's uh, legal, the in legal analysis on the NSA program. I was stunned by how much of it was unclassified, but yet the analysis was being kept close hold and, and not being able to be reviewed. You had to go to the White House. You had to sit there under the watchful, hawkish eye of an individual as you read it. Uh, if any notes you took could not be taken with you, they had to be kept there. And I felt like turning around when I read them and think, is this what it's all about, this, these, these few pages? I think history has shown that the legal analyses done about the NSA program and the CIA's detention program under highly pressurized situation after the White House attorney, David Addington, working on behalf of Vice President Cheney, had already basically pronounced them as being legal. Once they were done, I, I felt like it, it was a, a, a subpar effort at trying to really a probe the complexities of what was being undertaken. I've told you earlier that I thought there was value to these programs, although sometimes overstated and certainly oversold. But at the same time, these were individuals that had seen what had happened in 9-11 and were looking to act quickly and didn't want to be bound by Congress, the courts, in the case of the NSA program, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, and they wanted a piece of paper that basically they could show the president and say, this is legal. Uh, now, my understanding is that much of what John, you wrote in justification for the legality of those programs has been um, scrutinized and found to be wanting. Um, I'm not going to put myself into a legal uh, position of legal an analysis or analyst, but Again, I think he was trying to do the right job. I think he was put in an unenviable position. And I think uh, history has shown that uh, there, were, there was uh, some superficiality to what he had done, and others had done, too, without invoking other names. Let me make a, let me make a few comments. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with Andy in terms of the motivation uh, that we had at the time in terms of seeking uh, legal opinions that would give us uh, the authority to do what we did. Um, and in fact, uh, what uh, people may not recognize is, is that we didn't want our own lawyers in the CIA, for example, uh, to look at, at the legality of certain activity uh, because we really didn't want to have uh, uh, the accusation that that was not going to be an objective uh, legal review uh, because quite frankly, uh, we, we knew we were going to have to operate within the law despite uh, the 9-11 tragedy. And despite the emotion that was running so high in our country and, frankly, on the Hill, uh, to have us go after al-Qaeda, uh, that was a very, very intense time uh, that we were all feeling. But despite that, despite that, the Office of our General Counsel 
needed to have, thought we needed to have clear legal guidance about what we were going to do. Um, and it's publicly acknowledged now that, um, that in doing so, we described in great detail uh, the kinds of, of activities, the coercive techniques, if you will, uh, that we plan to apply. But we would have been bound by whatever legal opinion came out of the Justice Department. We weren't shopping for one. Um, Andy is quite right. Uh, the, the, the opinions on that program, the, de the detention program, as well as the NSA program, uh, became controversial within the Justice Department and elsewhere. Um, when a deputy attorney general by the name of Comey came into office, who happens to now be the FBI director, uh, he had a, a review of those opinions uh, undertaken uh, and questioned those opinions. And I will tell you that from the CIA detention standpoint, the interrogation program, when questions came about the legality of those programs, those programs stopped for a period of time until we got a revalidation from the Justice Department that what we were doing was legal. Uh, that was to the dismay of many people in the executive branch, but the director and later the acting director of CIA said, we're not going to subject our officers to engaging in legal, illegal activity uh, that's not authorized by the Department of Justice. So, John, you had left the scene at that time. Uh, other lawyers took a look at it and, and validated in the NSA case, not all of the program. Andy's quite right, uh, but, but some of the programs. So um, again, what people may not appreciate is that uh, CIA has to operate within U.S. law, and we don't want to subject officers to, to be accused of illegality. Yeah, and let me just raise one specific example, just to add on to that. Um, and it stuck out of my mind when John was responding, and I think John did a very good job of, of, of putting it in perspective in terms of what CIA was prepared to do, given whatever the legal analysis was, is before this program was ever fully briefed to the Congress, when I say fully briefed to the full intelligence uh, committees, but and kept to the Gang of Eight, um, had a very capable, very capable CIA inspector general mm -hmm. do a number of reviews uh, into the detention and interrogation program. And his findings were, were objective and tough and in some cases resulted in referrals to the Justice Department for criminal activities that they believe might have occurred. But one thing that John, uh, John Helgerson is his name, uh, and his staff highlighted, which kind of pinpoints the issue about the scope and the nature of these legal analysis, was there's so much discussion about, is this torture? Is waterboarding church? Mm -hmm. you, know, are we, uh, you know, are we conducting something that's in violation of uh, international law, U.S. law, et cetera? Uh, hit pause for a second. I have no doubt it was torture, waterboarding. You know? And I would ask anybody who thought otherwise to be waterboarded and then come out of the experience and think that wasn't torture. And pause. Mm -hmm. Is the issue wasn't just whether it was torture. That's what they focused on the analysis. Because there's torture and there's a whole host of other things that are criminally liable dealing with physical harm, abuse, and other, uh, other manifestations of, of coercion. He raised the question. He didn't answer the question. There's a gap here. We may answer the question, is it torture, and say, no, it's not. And there's a debate about that. But who asked the question and who answered the question about whether criminal statutes in the United States could be applied against CIA officials for what they're doing short of torture. It's a gap in the analysis. Now that put a lot of people, made them sweat, made them think about lowering up the whole phrase, but, but in reality, it illustrates what I was saying earlier, which is a more fundamentally thorough and legal analysis of these programs would have avoided that suspension of the program that occurred to the dismay of the operations of folks. And it would have also, I think, put us on a more sound legal footing moving forward had we had buy-in from all parties, not just a select few. So I just want to point that out as a specific example. Okay, I was right. We could keep you here till midnight, <laughs> but I'm afraid we've run out of time. John Mossman, Annie Johnson, thank you so much for a very stimulating, responsive session. <laughs>